hey there gang, let's do a headstock, shall we? It's been a while. And it's the same old story, the Gibson fight for love and glory. It's case of do or die. This is a Les Paul from 1992. And it isn't this Gibson's first trip to the headstock rodeo, actually. This was fixed and rebroken. How does that happen? Sometimes it's insufficient clamping pressure during the glue up. Sometimes it's just bad geometry in the brake itself that doesn't leave sufficient glue surface area. Um, sometimes the, if it's been exposed to extremes of heat or humidity in the case, that can soften the glue and it'll yawn open. Other times it's just luck because, as I said in the past, every time you drop it, it's going to break. It's the price you pay to play a Les Paul. It's the same thing with million dollar Stradivari cellos or a Lalique phase. Of course, nobody tells violin makers to strengthen the peg head design on their Strad copies, and you can trumpet your opinion as loud as you want, but Gibson isn't going to change because of what you say. So what do we do? This has been broken for a very long time. Decades now. Nobody wanted to touch it after the first break. And at this point, if you've been following along, you'll know how I'm going to handle this. Uh, not to say that there aren't alternatives. Other people have different methods of putting these things back together. If they work, they work. I'm mostly concerned with providing enough structure that spans the broken area to compensate for the loss of rigidity here. And we understand that the strings are exerting a considerable amount of force that wants this to fold up, and we need to counteract that. So I'm going to be cutting away considerable portions of this wood here around the break, make it nice and smooth and square, so the new pieces I glue in are going to have a good surface to bond with. It's pretty much as simple as that. So let's do it. If you're faced with a repair on a stringed instrument and you're tempted to put metal into it, reconfigure. Change the mindset. You almost never gain anything from it, and consider that if it breaks again, you might be the one faced with having to undo it. Even if screws were required as a clamping device to hold the parts together, and that sometimes happens, sometimes things don't want to go back together, when the glue is dry, take them out and put a couple of wood dowels in there instead. It's going to be as strong, this is unnecessary, and it's ineffective. As you can see, the next time it broke, it moved just beyond the mechanical advantage of those screws and fractured a little on down the line. And this happens all the time. I've mentioned this before too. You can try and strengthen one area of the headstock and the impact or the inertia force really doesn't care. It just gets transferred on to the next weakest place and that's where it breaks. Um, this even happens with properly glued brakes without reinforcement. Usually the glued area is stronger than the surrounding wood and then you'll see that the next line of fracture will be parallel to it eh, about an eighth of an inch away from the original one. In this case it broke in a far more difficult location. It's much harder to repair. I would have preferred it to break along the previous line actually because this is going to take way more effort to put back together. This was either very calculated or exceptionally lucky because these screws are pushing up against and into the head plate veneer. And what's going on with the surface here? Mm, I don't know. I think maybe it was oversprayed with some incompatible finish, like a polyurethane or something. It's wrinkled. It almost looks like it's got like a piece of saran wrap over it. Very strange. It might get a little bit brutal looking here, but again, a lot of this material will be cut away. And I can't really take these out from this side. There's just no avenue of attack, so to cut away enough that I can grab hold of these things with locking pliers or something. You're going to try and introduce me to screw extractors 
remember, I used to work for a tool company. The faces of these have been cut at an angle, and it wouldn't work very well. And as it turns out, there was also the addition of some glue. Like I said, all of this damage you see here is going to get routed away. The thing is, it's not just the glue. There are six more small screws inserted from the front, and some of them are binding with the threads on the big ones. Fun, isn't it? To get the glue to let go, I heated things up with a soldering, soldering iron, and with that I was finally able to get them loose. The big screws, anyway. The small screws were really buried and cut flush with the top. I had to file slots to accept a screwdriver, and in the end I figured it would be best just to cut out a pocket around them to be filled with solid wood later on. Ugh. There's a treasure trove. I should save some for future use. Checking here to see how things fit. There are chunks missing, and you realize, right, that this is about as bad a break as you can get. They don't come much worse. We'll pry off the truss rod washer. And I'll paint the threads with some paste wax to prevent the glue from sticking. To start off with, I'll use a good quantity of super glue. This is just to hold the parts in proper alignment. It's quick. I don't have to come up with some elaborate clamping system. I become the clamp of flesh and bone and guile. Don't press too hard, it's very tenuous. To remind myself of the truss rod inside, I'll cut a piece of tape to act as a marker, and then I'll measure the greatest possible depth I can route. It's always the same, about 21 millimeters, but I check it every time. I can correct the angle of the jig by shimming it up with cork, which also acts as padding. Then I glue the end of the jig to the neck with tape interceding, and clamp the far end to the headstock using a padded call. It doesn't look like it would be a very secure way of holding things, but it's surprisingly solid. One more check of the depth. I want to come close to, but not into, the fingerboard binding or through the face of the headstock. Steady hand and nerves of steel is all that's required. No kidding, the first time you do this, it's a really scary thing. I set the router to full depth and then take very small bites. Here's what's left. I routed right through the truss rod pocket, as you can see. I can't route both sides at this time, or it would just totally fall apart. So I go about plugging side one. I make a nice snug plug and then use a circle template to mark the quarter rounds on each side. This is just kind of a loose guideline. I suppose I could come up with a jig that would do this repeatedly, but it's fun to use a chisel and sneak up on the right fit and practice the hand tool skills. It can be beneficial in other areas of the craft, too. To start off with, the fit is close but not great, so I'll use a sanding block to refine things. Taking little bits at a time, checking and rechecking. That's a nice, tight plug. To make carving easier, I'll take some preliminary cuts to get rid of the excess, and then glue it in. I use the surgical tubing as a clamp, and then I use a clamp to clamp the clamp. The second side is very much like the first. I have this other template to make a bridging plug in the center of the neck. I sneak up on the depth. I know I'm there when I just nick the rubber sleeve around the truss rod. That's a good stopping point. Then I have to fit that plug in place. Same deal. It's just a little more tricky due to there being four corners on this one. But eventually that goes in there too nicely. Carving is simply a process of taking away anything that doesn't look like a suspiciously muscular Renaissance woman. I use a collection of chisels and Swedish style carving knives. It looks fun and relaxing, but you've got to be thinking and feeling all the time. Recognizing which way the grain is running, changing your angle of attack. Eventually I get to the point where I'm using a file here to blend in the surfaces. The goal is to produce something that's smooth and regular and that transitions into what's already there. There's still a big void of missing wood under the nut, and I'll make up a plug for that. 
Here I'm carving away the excess wood that intruded into the truss rod pocket using a small gouge. Going against the grain in this case because it's the only way I could cut it. I'll make up some filler pieces to replace what had to come out to get at those screws. Then I'll carve that back. Make that a bit more aesthetically pleasing. And I'll check to make sure that I can get the socket in and then reinstall the washer and the nut. I decided it would be worth it to try and clean up the odd delaminated looking surface. The wrinkles were under this top layer as if the original lacquer had buckled. Like the top surface was relatively flat, but it looked like it had been bent. I had to sand through it all essentially to the bare surface below. But I couldn't do that in the center, which has the all-important Les Paul signature. Luckily, the damage did not extend that far. So I got as close as I dared, and then gingerly sanded off some of the overlying lacquer. Need to darken up that maple, so I put on a rudimentary mask, and I shot a quick coat of black from a rather splattery spray can. The mahogany needs filling. So I put on a couple of coats of aqua coat fill that I've tinted with some brown dye. After that, I sanded back the excess. Then I airbrushed on several thin coats of cherry red mixed with a tiny touch of black. I don't mind that the end result is a little darker than the surrounding wood because some of this is going to get sanded back and it looks more prominent than it does in real life. So the process of finishing this involves sanding and then spraying clear coats on top. Before that, I need to scrape the overspray from the binding. It's one of those meticulous jobs. Then I just spray on a whole lot of lacquer and thin layers over the course of a day and a half. It helps to sand as flat as you possibly can every few coats. It still takes an awful lot of lacquer to get something like this flat, and I'll try to explain why. One thing to remember here is that the plug we inlaid came relatively even with the surface of the lacquer that was already on the instrument. That means there's a disparity in height. Any new lacquer we put on is going to be taller or above the surface of the original stuff. We're also dealing with a fresh plug glued into old wood. They've been sitting in the same shop for long enough that they should have similar moisture levels now, but the effects of glue and clamping mean that it's possible that the plug will change shape a little bit. So in order to get a surface that is continuous and we can safely sand level, we need to apply a lot more lacquer to account for the height disparity. We could, of course, strip the whole neck and start fresh from the bottom up. That's a huge job. We'd lose the serial number on the back of the headstock, and it just kind of feels like overkill, right? So you can see how much material we're going to need to sand through to get flat surfaces that sort of blend in with the original finish around the repair. Here's the thing. Nitrocellulose lacquer shrinks, and it continues to shrink for a very long time. And the thicker the layer, the longer it takes to shrink. You know, it gets dry enough to sand within a day or two, but if you do that, it might retract so much that it may even crack around the perimeter of the plug. This is something I don't think the general public really comprehends. Um, it's not like finishing a new piece of furniture. Longer is better. Months are necessary to get it cured enough that you won't see witness lines between the old and new parts. And even then, there'll almost always be some perceptible dips in the surface that show up over time. So the absolute bare minimum before buffing would be a week. We can sort of speed up the curing time a little bit by doing a preliminary leveling after a few days. This cuts through the outer skin of the fresh lacquer and opens it up to allow more trapped solvent to off-gas. Then you let it sit for some more time and finally sand and buff it to get it shiny. It's pretty shiny right now, after eight coats, but this has still got a lot of curing to do. It's still very soft. You can feel it when you touch it. Starting off with 1000 grit wet or dry paper, which I'm going to use dry. See, this is not a pristine brand new guitar. It's 30 years old. It was played, and looking at it, um, it wasn't babied. It's got a lot of patina, so... If there's a super fine network of surface textures when I'm done here, that's probably okay. It'll actually look probably better than having something super flat. 
slight surface imperfections and stuff are not going to bother me. The thing is to use a very light touch. There's virtually no pressure downwards. Uh, and constantly be cleaning off the surface of the sandpaper so that you know you don't get balled up crumbs of lacquer getting mashed down against the surface. That can do more damage than the actual sandpaper itself. Up next I'm using this stuff. This is Abrilon. It's a good idea to give the surface a quick cleaning in between grits just to get off any particles that may be left on the surface. On flat areas it's fun and speedy to use a foam pad in my drill and some medium automotive polishing compound. Makes pretty quick work of the situation. The more compound curves of the neck are best done by hand, I think. Time to cut through the intersection of lacquer and tape over the truss rod cavity. And we'll put on the tuners. As you can see, at some point the originals were swapped out for Grovers, which is kind of a classic move. A whole lot of Les Pauls were changed to Grovers in the 70s. I want these nuts snug, but not too tight. Otherwise the lacquer might crack if the headstock swells up when summer arrives. The frets are okay. They just need some cleaning and polishing. There's a short look at the interior. Everything seems good. I was asked to check the continuity between the tailpiece ground and the harness, and it was fine. Just a little truss rod adjustment. The ends of the cover are a little worse for wear, but they still function. Okay, at long last. There's still a few little touches that need doing. It's missing its switch tip, and I'm actually fresh out of those, so I'm waiting for that. Also waiting or was waiting because the order was cancelled for some different uh, mirror top knobs but it's now in one piece and it's playable just a little reminder of where we started off with this thing and here we are now I think that's quite a bit better that'll do